Welcome to the December 16th meeting of the Milton School Committee. Please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do we have any additions or corrections to tonight's agenda? I don't think we have any executive session items. Oh, I think we have one executive session item. Email <coughs> go personnel um, salary. Okay, not tonight then, thank you. <laughs> um, and we have no one here for citizens speak. So we'll move right into approval of minutes. We have the minutes from our November 6th school committee meeting. Second. Moved by Mr. Walker, seconded by Mr. Zulis. Any um, additions or corrections? Hearing none, all in favor? It's unanimous, thank you. And Superintendent Gormley. What you're in the house. <coughs> Milton High School students? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, at recent reception hosted by the Milton Times School Committee Chair, Linda Lee Sheridan was presented with the first True Miltonian Award for her years of service to the Milton community. Congratulations. On December 18th, the Milton High School Ensemble Winter Concert will be taking place in the Charles Winchester Auditorium at 7 o'clock. Uh, dates will be announced shortly for kindergarten and first grade information nights. Also, the school committee meeting will, I mean, with the warrant committee on December 19th regarding the FY15 budget. The school committee is in the process of setting up budget presentations for school PTOs. And the winter recess beginning December 23rd and students return on January 2nd. Also in sports, all three boys basketball teams won their first games and the varsity team won in overtime over Hingham, right? Yeah. Won over Hingham 71-63. Uh, and then the uh, boys hockey team got their first win over Braintree the other day, four to two. And their first home game is this Friday. And then with girls basketball. Uh, uh, the varsity girls, vars yes. <laughs> sorry. Uh, the girls varsity basketball won their first game. And also the girls basketball opens tomorrow's, bleh. the girls varsity home game the first home game is tomorrow, starting with the freshman at 345. Excellent. Thank you. And that's it. Excellent. Thank you. <clears throat> Moving on to the chairman's report, um, school committee members have received the, a copy of the draft of our annual report, which when we approve it will be submitted to the town for inclusion in the town's annual report, which is published and mailed out to all homes. Did everyone have a chance to look at that? And did anyone have any additions or corrections to this? Any edits? I'd like to take a moment. Um, this uh, submission to the annual report has developed over the years, and I'd like to recognize Maura Downs, who worked with every one of our principals, curriculum coordinators, uh, the director of SPED, community schools, and um, they all work collaboratively with Maura submitted and Maura did the <coughs> editing and worked individually with each one of them. So I want to thank Maura uh, for this excellent summary in the annual report. And Maura, who is also our, the school committee's uh, secretary. So we Maura Downs. appreciate all the work you do, Maura. <clears throat> if no one has any additions or corrections, I would just like to say that this is a great reflection of the amazing work that's done every year and honestly every year when I look it over I'm, I'm quite surprised and taken aback a little bit at, at all that's been accomplished in any given year so um, I encourage community members to read this when it is delivered to your home. Hearing no edits, uh, I need, I'll entertain a motion to accept the annual report as written. So moved. 
Moved by Mrs. Padir, a second by Mrs. Kelly. All in favor? <coughs> Opposed? Abstained. Abstained, okay. <laughs> Thank you. And um, health and wellness report, Mrs. Padir, please. <coughs> health and wellness update. Um, well, last week um, we went, we actually, we had a meeting this week, but the main topic of it was um, the conference that uh, Jackie Morgan and I and Larry Rooney attended, which was fantastic. Um, one of the subjects um, <coughs> that came up in one of the uh, breakout sessions that we went to, Mr. Rooney and I, was about how to bring physical activity into the classroom, um, and sometimes not in the form of adding physical education, but using, you know, teachers working together, as in the example they gave us was a teacher who was a physical therapist um, and a science teacher. So in the science class, they taught the water table, but they did it using a water table dance with elementary students. And once again, it was kind of that collaboration <coughs> where, okay, we can't, we don't have the money or the time. They didn't have a gym to add physical education, but how can we add activity to the classroom in doing that? Um, the conference also really focused on breakfast, which we do have a breakfast program, which is fantastic, but um, using time in, even in the classroom, the subject was brought up of breakfast in the classroom, so teaching while students would have breakfast, because some of the schedules, if you think of it, especially the high school and the middle school, the kids get to school very early, and so maybe they don't eat because it's too early for them to actually be hungry. Um, so they talked about physical activity before they get to school and then breakfast once they get to school. Some of those ideas in other classrooms uh, that they've been talking about it. I think Mr. Rooney has investigated the, uh, it's called the BOX program through ReBox. And that would involve the elementary schools having activity, physical activity in the morning before kids start school. It would be kind of led by parents, but there would be a, um, a school person running it. And... Uh, there's grant money available for that, so we're looking further into that. And we also talked a little bit about um, speakers for um, next year. Um, one of the speakers at the conference was excellent. They talked a lot about nutrition for performance. So not just what you should or shouldn't do, but nutrition as a way of positive, what you can do with nutrition. Um, because this, this guy was the, is a nutrition guy for the Patriots, and so he talked a lot about changing body composition to perform. So I thought that was really interesting to focus with students, not just, oh, you shouldn't eat this, you shouldn't this, what you could do with proper nutrition to excel or perform even better. So we talked a little bit about that. And uh, we're going to, um, <coughs> I think, uh, some of us were talking, too, about um, working on our schedule of events and things that we're doing and, and also resources for parents to get on the website. So we're still working on that. Great. I, I, um, I wasn't able to attend that meeting, mm -hmm. but Larry Rooney, our new athletic director, arranged to have the representatives from Reebok come mm -hmm. to present at my PTO meeting. So last Thursday night, um, the creator of the program and two Reebok employees attended and Reebok employees who live in Milton are very anxious to begin this program. So each of our principals with the PTO presidents are applying for a $1,000 grant, the four elementaries and middle school. And in January, the parents will get an all call who's interested in being trained. And we're going to start with two mornings a week at each of our elementary and middle, this exercise program before school based on the book Sparks and the exercise before school. And um, the Reebok people told us that in some of the 700 schools they uh, began in, every single child comes before school for the activity before school, maybe five days, maybe two days. So the PTO presidents were very enthusiastic, and I have to give credit to Reebok. Uh, they came out for the evening meeting, they presented, and we're going to jump in in January. And they guaranteed each school um, the $1,000 startup money yep. for writing the grant. So that's exciting. Very exciting. So Larry Rooney deserves a lot of credit. He came to the PTO president's meeting, and he's going to be our point person with the PTO presidents. Yeah, I think he did a really good job, and too, he presented it as there's some, it's physical activity for anyone, not just, you know, it's not specifically geared to, you know, athletics. You don't have to be an athlete or, you know, that athletic to do it. 
um, and they give an example of that. At the conference, of course, they put us through this whole thing where they didn't feed us breakfast for a long time through the meeting so that we could, you know, experience how, how hard it is to listen when you're hungry. And then they made us exercise before lunch because they're like, we need to, you have to get, you become more hungry. If, you know, recess before lunch was a big topic. Recess should come before lunch. So um, I think that, and Mr. Rudy did jump right in with the Reebok and we're excited about it. So it really should give an offering to um, a lot of students that maybe don't get a chance for as much phys physical activity, you know, kind of equalize that. We talked a lot about, um, the presenters in the conference talked a lot about using nutrition and exercise as a way of closing other gaps um, because students that are hungry or students that don't have the proper exercise and nutrition, it's hard to listen, it's hard to concentrate, it's hard to behave. So it's just another way of, you know, equalizing everything and, and closing gaps. Well, College is doing research on the program to the correlation to increase student achievement of the students who are involved in the program. Thank you for that report. We're moving so quickly today. Tonight. <laughs> moving right along to the Finance Subcommittee report, the long-awaited fiscal year 15 budget. Mrs. Kelly? So this, I promise, will not be as quick as the <laughs> other items. Um, a whole bunch of thank yous go out um, to the work put into this. Um, first, the administration, all the time and effort of the uh, administrators here and the leadership team. Finance Subcommittee for the many morning meetings that we've had to come to this point, as well as the full committee for um, for allowing us to extend beyond what our initial deadline was, and you know, creating this meeting on December 16th, which isn't easy with the holidays, etc. So we appreciate all the efforts that have gone into this. Um, this has changed a bit and has evolved over the sort of the meetings that we've had. So I turn it over now to the administration to present. Um, what we have thus far with the hope of getting a vote both on the advancement initiative as well as the entire budget to move forward to the Warren Committee. Um, and so as thank yous go, I uh, follow up with Mrs. Kelly's leadership on finance, driving us to make our deadline. Um, Mary Kelly, Leroy Walker, and Mike Zulis, this is a team. And so um, we're a team with them in developing this and uh, their taskmasters they send us back for more edits and more information, and they want the message to be clear and articulate. So we've worked through Finance Subcommittee. We'll present tonight. Then we'll present at Warren Committee Thursday night. And then with the PTO presidents, we're finalizing <coughs> with school committee members, calendars, uh, January uh, presentations by this team out in every one of the schools <coughs> for our parents. And we'll publish all of those dates so that if you're not available at one, you can go to another school's presentation. And so we're going to present uh, this budget presentation tonight. This will be on the web tomorrow. I'd ask anyone on the school committee or finance subcommittee member to stop us at any time, uh, since my voice might be difficult. Can we stop you now? I would, I would just <laughs> echo the uh, thank yous, particularly to the administration. Uh, we have an extraordinarily <coughs> dedicated team, as you can see. Mr. Pavlicek is operating with one arm. <laughs> the superintendent has no voice. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Phelan is the only healthy one in the bunch. Of them. <laughs> Steering the ship. <laughs> um, so this would be painful to listen to my voice. And so I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Phelan and Mr. Pavlicek. But they said we could all interrupt at any time and um, comment on any part of the presentation. So Mr. Phelan, sure. Mr. Pavlicek, thank you. Um, in front of you, you have a, um, a presentation for the entire uh, FY15 budget. Uh, and we want to make sure everybody is aware before we move forward uh, with the FY15 budget that we um, remind the f uh, folks uh, in the, uh, at home in the Warren Committee in the community that we do have an advancement budget that will be uh, part of our FY15 budget. And we wanted to make sure that everybody knew and we were transparent about what we did with our uh, advancement budget initiatives and funding from the previous year. So we're, it's all going to be one budget in the end. Uh, we look forward to presenting uh, this advancement 2.0. So last year's advancement 1.0 budget is the resources that were allocated for the school year that we're in, the 13-14 school year. 
And within the budget that we'll present tonight is the Advancement Budget 2.0, which will support uh, initiatives going into the 14-15 school year. But the first question we feel respectful that we should uh, answer uh, is how do we utilize the Advancement Budget uh, 1.0 funds and what progress have we made toward that end? Uh, similar to when we presented at this meeting uh, table uh, two weeks ago when we presented the, in the initial version of our advancement budget, we talked about the process by which we uh, came up with the advancement initiatives for the FY14. Um, it was a leadership uh, uh, work that included all of our principals, all of our curriculum folks um, in that money that we were hoping to uh, find and allocate were targeted towards three specific areas that we felt as a district after, after our research and data review that we needed to move forward three areas of the Milton Public Schools. So we were fortunate to get $515,000 in additional funding. We were fortunate to be able to get a group of folks together, our leadership team, and come up with initiatives that were based on the research and the input of the full team. And then we are very, very uh, happy to be able to implement this first year uh, of allocation in research towards the initiatives of literacy, early literacy, science and STEM, and closing the proficiency gap. So we got around uh, the table, we came up with that research, we came up with those metrics, and we were very uh, fortunate to have a successful outcome with the Warren Committee and the town meeting. So what did that buy us? What that bought us was uh, and what do we do with those funds? We were able to, with this advancement money in the school year that we're in right now, hire two reading specialists at the elementary level to support early literacy, hired one media center specialist to support early literacy, bought materials for formative assessments for grades one and two that also extended in grades three through seven, provided reading curriculum materials, uh, provided professional development around those readers and writers workshop um, materials and our assessment materials uh, to support uh, our early literacy initiative in grades one and two. In the area of closing the proficiency gap, we were able to target extended day opportunities uh, for our students to accelerate their learning uh, for those students who did not meet with success. We were able to purchase software that we are using to <coughs> analyze the data in those assessments that we just discussed earlier to make sure that we're targeting the right students, we have in, in targeting the right resources uh, in the classroom to, to make the best use of our reading specialists and our teaching opportunities. In addition to that, we did buy materials that we would have support those after school and before school and extended opportunities for students who need that accelerated student achievement. In the area of science and STEM, we hired a 1.0 science coordinator at the elementary level. She is in uh, the job. She's doing a fantastic uh, set of work with the MFE, with the teachers and with the students. We purchased the We Do Robotics materials that are right now in the hands of our grade two teachers and grade two students. We purchased hands-on science materials for our middle school uh, for grades six through eight, which are in the hands of teachers and now in the hands of students engaging children uh, in hands-on activity every day at the Pearson each grade. And we provided the professional <coughs> development to support that work uh, for the PS staff. So when it comes to uh, checking off the box of whether or not we met the goals uh, of implementation, we put all the infrastructure in place. Uh, we utilized the funds that were given to us by the Warren Committee in exactly the fashion that we outlined, and we are very appreciative to have all those in place. The next question becomes, were there any successes that we can speak to uh, around the initiatives that we have started in the implementation? Well, as you know, we haven't been able to assess the formal scores because they won't happen until uh, the students take the park and the MCAS exam in the spring, and we won't get those results until summer. But there are indicators that we are meeting with success in this implementation. First of all, uh, we do have those robotic uh, and STEM materials, um, and we do have uh, all students in grades one and two in the innovation pathway engaged in we do robotics and STEM. 300 students impacted by this uh, initiative. It's very, very exciting. The innovation pathway and the STEM initiative now impacts 300 students district-wide and will be going up each grade as we go on in, in the school years. Early literacy and literacy assessment, all students in grades one through seven, that's 2,100 students have been impacted by having their reading um, levels assessed, teachers analyzing those uh, reading levels and organizing supports and in, in, in interventions for students, uh, not just in grades one and two, which is the early literacy, but also carrying through 
grades one through seven. So that's very exciting use of the materials in the uh, resources that were allocated. Reading specialists are now providing direct student support for over 180 students in grades one and two. So all that information that we gather around the reading levels of our students with that reading assessment material that was purchased now targets the work for our reading specialists and we are servicing 180 students uh, this year in grades one and two for early literacy intervention. Hands-on science materials are impacting 900 plus students at the middle school. The nine teachers, the nine science teachers and the science coordinator are working very hard to uh, improve their instructional tech techniques, utilize the hands-on uh, materials, and these 900 students are gaining uh, each day uh, in their science instruction. Professional development sessions in assessment and instructional practices across science, STEM, and quite frankly, early literacy have been conducted and are ongoing all year. This work started in August before school started and carries on throughout the year in the professional development that teachers are able to access. The student achievement strategy meetings uh, for the proficiency gap that the superintendent, myself, Mr. Pavlicek, and the coordinators and principals take part in, all uh, that work goes to determining how the learning <coughs> and the learning outcomes of each student can be impacted and maximized by extended learning opportunities before and after school. So these are meetings where we physically go to schools, we look at all the data, we make sure that the resources are in the right places, <coughs> and then we also brainstorm with principals, what do you need beyond that to make sure that these students who are not meeting with success have added or extended learning opportunities to make sure that we maximize their learning experiences. And during the 2013-14 the, school year, we can say approximately 314 students, K to 12, in the Milton Public Schools will have an extended learning opportunity because of those funds that were generated and supported by the Warren Committee and the, and the school committee for our advancement budget. So even though we don't have updated MCAS or PARC scores because they don't come out until the spring, we do have real students who live and go to school in Milton being impacted by the teaching, the learning, and the materials and professional development provided. And we feel that this uh, is a great indicator of success of the advancement budget 1.0 uh, as of December 13th, 2013. That's a great segue into why we feel that uh, when we look at should we be moving forward in the advancement budget 2.0. So what does it look like right now when we think about what we need next year in school year 14-15 to continue this work? <laughs> the first thing we ask is if we have, do we still have a need and what does the data say? So we, we researched for advancement budget 1.0 the three areas of early literacy, proficiency gap, and science, and found that we had some scores that we felt were a challenge that we should take on to move the system forward. We wanted to review the data one more time with the spring 2013 data to ensure that we were still pointing all of our work in the right direction. So when we look at our early literacy data, we see that 29% of our students scored below proficient in grade three of the 2013 language arts MCAS exam. 28% of the students scored below proficient on the grade three MCAS in English language arts in, in 2013. That is absolutely still a need. We only uh, showed a 1% uh, increase in the right direction, and quite frankly, that's not enough. So the reason why we're trying to compare the 12 data to the 13 data is to make sure that the data that we have is solid and now has a two-year trend that we can look at. So clearly, we see out loud uh, in the data that we are uh, flat in our literacy skills in our students in grade three, and the target of early literacy is still one that the, that the system should prioritize. I should also point out that the CPI value that we uh, take with the state uh, shows a drop in identified low achievement groups as well. Uh, just an added uh, lever that we would like to say out loud that this early literacy data still is pointing us in the direction of needing to support this area of the district. The proficiency gap data is, is a little more complicated to bring up because we're looking at how do students in high needs and how do African American students, our two uh, subgroups that we want to support, how do they do in, in English language arts, math, and science? How do they do in 2012 and how do they do in 2013? So to break this down a little bit for you, what we're seeing here is in 2012, 45% of our high needs students scored below proficiency in, in English. 54 score, scored below proficiency in math, and 61 below in science. 
If we take that pocket right now and you go down to 2013, you'll see that we have similar numbers. There's not much of a difference between these high need students in the areas of ELA, math and science from 2012 to 2013. Our high need students now we know and we should continue to say out loud, definitely need the support of the school committee and the school administration to focus an initiative on their success. When we look at the other subgroup that we uh, feel needs support in targeted instruction is our African American subgroup. As you can see in 2012, 40% were below proficient in ELA, 53% below proficient in math, and 59% of those students were uh, not scored below proficient in science. When you take that group of African American students and you bring them down to their spring <coughs> of 13 scores, you see similar scores and similar percentages here. So this chart demonstrates that we have a two-year trend, that there's an area of need in the district, uh, that we wanted to make sure and check uh, at year two that are we still in need of this area to be an initiative uh, that's a district-wide initiative for the district, and we feel the answer to that is yes. Mr. Phelan, could you please just articulate exactly what a high-needs student, what, what? Sure. Con a high-needs student, according to the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, is a child who's either on an IEP or is low income or is a student whose first language is something other than English. Thank you. So the next area of our initiatives we wanted to get data and compare 2012 data to our 2013 data is in the science STEM area. So in 2012, 37% of students were below proficient in grade five, 52 were below proficient in grade eight, and 18% below proficient in biology at the high school. When we come down to the spring of 13 data, 30% scored below in grade five, 58% scored below in grade eight, excuse me, and 19% scored below proficient at the high school. So we saw some, a little movement that we have uh, in terms of the data in fifth grade and in high school, but we still feel that these percentages are definitely not where uh, the Milton Public School should be in regards to student achievement in science and STEM, <coughs> and again, uh, giving us the conclusion that we still feel that this is an area to focus on. Mr. So, Phelan, yes. is, sorry, back to that other one. So is that last number, you said 19% were below proficient on biology, is it 19 or is it 9? It's 9%. It is 9, okay, thank you. You're welcome. So the conclusion of the three areas uh, that we are focusing on, early literacy proficiency gap in STEM, the above student data indicates that the priorities of the Advancement Budget 1.0 continue to be appropriate focus for the Milton Public Schools. <clears throat> so when we get to the appropriation for FY15 for the school administration, the budget request that we will outline will be the Advancement Budget 2.0, which is going to be the initiatives that we feel we need to support and continue, and the contractual obligations that we need to fulfill when we move the district forward between this fiscal year in 14 to the fiscal year in 15. The FY15 Advancement Budget 2.0 initiatives with the goal being to continue with effort to improve early literacy, close proficiency gaps, and improve science and STEM achievement. So there's the goal of our FY15 Advancement 2.0 initiative and budget. Again, emphasize early literacy and pre-K to three achievement, close the proficiency gaps, pre-K all the way through 12, and advance science and STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math initiatives, pre-K to 12. <coughs> so we are very, very happy to say that the initiatives that we started <coughs> last year are still the challenges that we want to take on uh, again this year and keep the momentum going with ad advancement 1.0 to now advancement 2.0. And we believe the data points us in that direction, and we believe that long commitment to this, these three initiatives will serve the district well. If you want the full research metrics and outcomes from our initial presentation last year on these three initiatives, please feel free to visit this website, and you can be able to view and download that full document at the link provided. We should mention that that was the presentation from last time and has changed a little this time. So some of the uh, points that are in that presentation you won't see tonight. So this is, that was the 
preliminary version. There are some changes tonight, but the metrics and data are still there and are still appropriate for our discussion. So the FY15 advancement initiatives are as follow. To move the district forward in the three areas that we discussed, we would like to uh, put in place a literacy specialist <laughs> full time to serve uh, grades one, two, and three, parent outreach liaison, a digital <coughs> education coordinator part time, a data specialist part time for a subtotal of advancement positions of $191,000. We would like to make sure that we provide professional development in all the areas that we're moving forward, and that amount would be $90,000 across all three initiatives. We would like to provide extended, lay, extended day learning programs for our students through our proficiency gap initiative for $67,000, early literacy and reading materials for $110,000, science curriculum materials, uh, especially to the elementary uh, level of $80,000, totaling $347,000. The total advancement initiatives for the Advancement 2.0 in the FY15 budget would total $538,000. Does anybody have any questions at this point in time? <coughs> Becky? Um, so the literacy specialists would be for grades one, two, and three, so they would service all four elementary schools? So, so the hope would be that we already have uh, elementary literacy specialists in place and we're adding to the complement of folks and we want to extend that to grade three. Okay. We also want to extend that to some programming that, we, programming that we're going to try to provide for, for, for four-year-olds who are entering, who have not entered kindergarten yet. So we will uh, regroup take that team of professionals and again we're allocating their time towards the most neediest students so really we place them where the data suggests that the reading levels need to be supported so they will all be district-wide folks and they'll be organized in a way that makes their workload and their work week as efficient as possible in terms of being in any one school for the majority of their time and right now uh, mr. Phelan would you explain how the <coughs> current complements only in grades one and two yes we currently have reading specialists that only work with grades one and two students and after reflection of this year with our assessment goal being what happens at the end of third grade we're really finding that we're uh, wanting to provide I'll interpret <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's no. like the signer yeah um, <laughs> what Mary Gormley said was um, so we really we have two goals by adding this uh, additional resource one is to extend the service to third grade to those students who are still continuing with uh, uh, a struggle in breaking the code in reading. And part of the time of this specialist or the combination of all these specialists will be to uh, hopefully provide some reach out to uh, students who haven't entered <coughs> the public schools yet to try to create a lit literature rich environment, whether it's through a two hour sit in and literacy uh, rich environment drop in group uh, in one of our schools to try to get our students who are coming into kindergarten the following year. Uh, prepared and engaged in, in a literature rich uh, experience so we think that by adding this one FTE we can re-examine how we allocate these resources extend grades one two three uh, to ensure that by the end of third grade we're at proficient and also do a little pre-work and invest in our four-year-olds to make sure that for whoever demonstrates that need and will come up with that measurement and that uh, protocol that we are servicing students before they even get to kindergarten in some sort of a literature rich experience that we think will benefit them when they walk into kindergarten the following year. Okay, so if I'm getting you straight then the reading specialists are kind of more structured at each of the schools. These literary specialists will extend kind of services to grade <coughs> three as well as even extend services to before kids get to school and work with students that might need a little bit more assistance that we might be missing. Correct. Okay. And then my second can I ask a second? You okay. certainly. <laughs> the parent outreach, parent liaison, um, we talked a little bit before at the last meeting, but I'm just wondering, again, is that person going to be reaching out to students in all schools, all levels? I believe the superintendent will have that position focused initially uh, at supporting the early literacy uh, program that we want to start, but we'll reach out to all programs in all schools. Yeah, I'm just wondering if they could fit in some of the things we talked about in terms of kids that are new to the system, tr transfer students that come and that 
you know, seem to sometimes struggle depending mm. on where <coughs> their background is or how many times they've moved places around, mm -hmm. if that could be a goal as well with the parent, um, the uh, parent outreach liaison, like kind of working with those transfer students to help them get on task. Absolutely. Okay. And then I just have one more question. Um, the how is there any crossover with the digital ed coordinator and the media specialist? So we see this position as uh, the, the digital educational coordinator will be the, the one who will have the vision of the front of the house, for lack of a better term, of what we want students to know and be able to do with technology in the Milton Public Schools. That is, what are we using the, for example, the Milton Foundation uh, was fortunate to give us $150,000 worth of devices. How do we want to use them? Who's going to shepherd that through? Who's going to lead that initiative? <coughs> that will be that person. They will definitely be working with the elementary media center specialist and the middle school media specialist and the high school media special specialist, all of whom are on the digital education, uh, digital learning team that we have going on right now. I feel that that person is the one who will have the vision to carry out what teachers and students should be uh, experiencing when they use all that new technology. The second position, the data specialist, is more around the lines of who's going to do the research, who's going to gather the data for when we want to sit down and make informed decisions and analyze student work and analyze student data uh, to support how we deploy our resources, that they're the one who can come up with those reports and that information. So when the superintendent wants to know how to act on a certain way with an, with an initiative, that that material and that data will be present for her to be able to view. So those are two definitely different uh, views of how technology can be used in the school, so we decided to break it out and have two separate positions. Great. And Mr. Phelan, I'd like to follow up on that because that was something that I spoke to Ms. Gormley about. I, you know that I've been advocating <coughs> for having an education uh, technology person um, on, our, on our staff, mm -hmm. and I am <coughs> thrilled that those have been broken out. Last time we looked at this, that was one position, mm -hmm. and I really felt strongly that they are two different, two very different skill sets, and so I think that's a great addition. I think that we will probably find very quickly, just as you did with the literacy specialist, that once we get that um, digital educational coordinator in there, that we're gonna find that we need even more of, mm -hmm. of that person. So I think this is these are really exciting opportunities here. Absolutely. And Ms. Bagley-Jones had a question, sorry. Um, so just, I'm sorry, I was late, but just a uh, comment to phrase my questions under. I'm a parent of a child who's doing very well in Milton Public Schools. Mm -hmm. Tell me why these things in general are gonna be helpful to my students. That's sort of the mm -hmm. foundation of what mm -hmm. I'm looking for. So a couple questions on that. On the literacy specialist, and it's worked different ways in the schools over the years, is this a pull-out model? Is this go into the classroom so that my kid, your kid, your kid, anybody can get help from that mm -hmm. person? Is it? the kids that are struggling in the teacher viewpoint, or is it in the classroom so it's less stigmatizing in terms of a pullout, you know, a true mm -hmm. inclusion mm -hmm. model versus here's a list of 10 kids, pull them out, mm -hmm. go give them some extra help, put them back in and everybody knows they left and, mm -hmm. you know, or whatever, I mean, that doesn't really matter. And so how are the kids identified, you know, and how much can we work <coughs> with that in inclusion a real, true inclusion model I'd be mm -hmm. really interested in hearing about. And then the second question about the parent outreach, and you all know how much I support a position like that, but what I've also found out over the years is often people in schools call upon a, person, a position like this to fix the situation. So I, as much as I want that position, I'd really like to see clarity at a later point fairly soon about what are the expectations? What are the job descriptions? Because otherwise it's pie in the sky. No offense, but it doesn't really, won't do anything if it's everything to all people, if it's not defined, if the goals are way too unrealistic. Uh, so I, you know that I'm behind that position, but I really do think before uh, I would like to have, before it goes much further, I'd really like to have a lot of clarity about that position. So taking your questions backwards, we'll get you clarity in, uh, on the position. Um, and to your first question, uh, the literacy specialists, uh, similar to how our special educators work, uh, we do as much pushing as we can. So as a child who may not have the lowest quote reading score level in his class, but maybe is on that verge, he or she is getting that support because 
there's more adults in that classroom. They're being broken out into different groups that are supervised by more adults. Uh, everybody is being assessed, not just students who may be below grade level. Uh, all students are, and we're going to be keeping tabs on those scores as students move forward. They'll be tested twice a year. So I think everybody gains by the early literacy work that we do. Uh, and then obviously some students gain specifically because they were getting uh, firsthand work with literacy specialists as well directly. So um, I think there's a little bit in there for everybody in terms of the overall experience of a child who may not need that service directly. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Zills, did you have a question? Uh, uh, just a comment. I, I think, John, um, it's important to point out that the, um, the line items for the materials, that those numbers uh, represent um, broad categories under which there are specific line items. Mm -hmm. In other words, you have specific targeted items for professional development. That's not just a $90,000 number. There are, there are items within that. I don't know if we want to take the time now to go into that, but I just think that's important to point out that those are not just broad dollar figures. You, you are correct, Member for the For the purposes of a summary slide, we did group things together by professional development and materials and science, et cetera. But there are targeted items in each one of those that go in each of those categories. Uh, and similar to how we presented the Advancement 1.0 budget with very, very specific positions and very specific sets of materials that we identified and did purchase and have now implemented the same backup as uh, in the Advancement 2.0. And that, that information would be available on the link that you showed a little earlier. And for all children, the early literacy and the science. Mary Gormey would like to say. It is available on the link that we provided. Um, and also that the, uh, the STEM initiative, uh, when we get to the question about and I think it's a broad question, but it's a very good question, is that some of these challenges uh, or initiatives that we're taking on are targeted, but some of the f are, are for the benefit of all students. The, the K-12 to science is every single child, every single grade, um, and um, early literacy benefits everybody, uh, and proficiency gap is really targeted. <coughs> so uh, we do think that there, this is a very, very broad uh, brush that we, we have here. And can I just make a follow-up point on that, too? I think that on that slide that was way back at the beginning about the successes, mm -hmm. that's exactly the information that came through loud and clear when you <coughs> look at the impact on the number of students across mm -hmm. the district that, um, that are impacted by these initiatives of mm -hmm. last year and even more so this mm -hmm. coming year. So it's very exciting. Mrs. Padera? I just have one more question. So the, the materials, the 347,000, do we know if those are... Re, any of those are reoccurring costs or just one-time costs for this year? There are definitely, uh, the science materials are one-time cost. Uh, the extended learning program materials could be considered one-time cost. And I believe uh, Assistant Superintendent uh, Pavlicek has outlined in a separate slide the potential one-time cost that we could uh, call out uh, because that may be an important piece of how this budget will be uh, able to move forward if we can provide that type of um, information to the Warren Committee. Okay. I'll wait for that slide. Appreciate that. <laughs> we'll lead it. All right. The rest of the drivers of this um, request uh, are not new initiatives but a continuation of our current initiatives. And as this outlines, we have the same the usual set of drivers that um, we have to look at technology, special education. Uh, transportation facilities and our negotiated agreements. So let's take a, a, a look at um, some of the principal drivers in terms of non-salary items. First one is a good news story. In the central administration category, we're actually, um, our cost <coughs> this year is going to go down significantly to the tune of $84,000 because we had some fairly uh, substantial expenses in the current fiscal year that are not going to be occurring next year. Um, this year was a uh, collective bargaining year, so we had a lot of legal expenses that we won't have next year in fiscal 15. We had, um, as was mentioned in last year's budget, um, a, a spike in uh, sick leave buyback for this particular year <coughs> that, um, will not occur again next year. Uh, people who uh, wish to take advantage of sick leave buyback have to have told us by now for next year, so we know what those numbers are. And we budgeted this year for some one-time costs for strategic planning um, that won't be recurring next year. 
So to the tune of $84,000, we're actually going to be decreasing our central administration budget. In the transportation um, section, we have an increase of $110,000. Um, that's an allowance because uh, this is the final year of our uh, regular ed bus transportation contract. We will be going out to bid for a new contract, um, and we have to assume a certain level of increased costs are, are going to be there. Um, and similarly, we have uh, our uh, special education bus contract are uh, up at the end of this year as well. And although we don't bid special education bus contracts uh, on Chapter 30B, we do have to, um, we have uh, half a dozen special ed uh, transportation companies that we contract with for all of our in district and out of district students. Um, and so we have to make some allowance for those costs too. Those are, are, are both expensive contracts. Um, special ed transportation is, is even more expensive than the regular yellow bus transportation is because <coughs> of the individualized nature of it. Um, in the athletics category, we've increased the general fund support for athletics um, by $100,000. Um, our athletic budget this past year is about $730,000. Um, only uh, less than half of that actually comes from support from the general fund. Um, the rest of it comes from uh, athletic fees and, in, and from uh, fundraising and uh, sources like that. Um, and what we found in the last few years is we've increased athletic fees um, and we've increased the need for fundraising, but we've actually increased them to a point where it really isn't sustainable. Um, we can't raise the kind of uh, money that we need to raise from fundraisers without having every team, going back to the days where every team was out selling Yankee candles every week, um, and we don't want to go there. And the issue with <coughs> uh, athletic fees is, of course, the higher you raise them, the fewer people can afford them, and you get a diminishing return both in the, the, the um, number of participants on your athletic teams and in the revenue it generates. So we've sort of hit a point of no return with athletics, and we really have to make a, 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 an effort to sort of refund it from the general fund. Um, because it really isn't sustainable the way it is now. Special education tuitions, um, we're estimating an increased cost of $100,000. Um, we don't know what the uh, state is going to approve for uh, cost of, uh, for instance, out of district uh, special education placements. So we've made a, an estimate, a percentage estimate based on um, some prior history. Um, we'll know that more uh, clearly in the next few months, but um, special education tuitions between cooperatives <coughs> and uh, out of district placements um, run in, into the many millions of dollars for us. Um, those are those are large numbers. Um, in technology, uh, it's already been mentioned once. We have the, the park assessment coming in. We are a site for this uh, test site for this this spring. It's going to be tested again next year. It's going to be rolled out to the state, assuming a positive vote of the uh, Board of Elementary and Secondary Education in, in two years. And it's going to replace the MCAS, and it is an online exam. And so we are going to have to have the resources to um, have a, a large number of our students taking online exams simultaneously at different levels, you know, the same way we do MCAS, except it's not pencil and paper. Um, and the uh, Technology Committee has been looking at where our resources are um, with respect to our capital requests, with respect to the wonderful work of the MFE over the last uh, year um, in terms of getting us hardware. And we estimate that we are still going to need some more. And so we are looking at uh, a two-year plan, two to three-year plan to get this hardware in place so that um, we will be in a position to actually accomplish PARC when it is rolled out. And hopefully with not an enormous um, purchase at the last minute. In terms of security, we are looking at a <coughs> second school resource officer um, in conjunction with the police department, and that will have a cost to it. Um, and with the security measures that we have installed in the various different schools, um, there is a cost to maintaining <coughs> those, whether it's maintenance contracts or, um, or just resources for the various equipment that we have. Um, so there's a $72,000 cost there. Um, utilities, we have budgeted a, a 4% increase in cost, about $50,000. Um, text materials and supplies has been um, cut over the last several years. 
Um, that's one of the places that, that frequently gets cut. We're trying to infuse some money back into it, and it's um, coupled with uh, starting a plan of copier and furniture replacement because every year we find ourselves um, replacing uh, old copy machines and older furniture. Um, and all of those uh, purchases at present are coming out of the principal's uh, accounts and are really uh, negatively affecting their ability to buy supplies, to buy books, to buy <coughs> so we're looking at a, a, an expense in that line to really bring that up to a, a more uh, sustainable level of funding. And the, the rest of our request of approximately $68,000 are from small increases in other costs, our facilities, our contracted services, and so forth. And so in terms of a general fund non-salary increase, we're looking for $571,252 in the fiscal 15 budget over the fiscal 14 budget. In <coughs> terms of salary items, which is the other part of this, um, the fiscal 14, um, we have you know, a uh, tentative agreement awaiting ratification <coughs> with the Educators Association. So the fiscal 14 um, anticipated salary, assuming uh, ratification of that um, agreement is $30,645,961. Um, again, assuming ratification of the agreement, next year there will be a, an added cost to that, assuming the staff rolls forward, of uh, $1,333,339. And um, from our advancement request, um, we are looking at a $258,000 increase to salary the, um, those are the positions that were outlined before, but also, for instance, some of the extended day positions that we talked, extended day learning opportunities that we talked about in um, the advancement budget are themselves salary items because you have to pay people to come in during the summer, you have to pay people to teach after school, you have to uh, pay people to teach before school. So in fact, the majority of the extended day learning um, costs of the advancement budget is in fact salary more than anything else. So it's, I have it included here. So that's why that number isn't exactly the same as the number you saw mm -hmm. eight, eight slides back. So our total fiscal 15 salary request is $32,237,300, or approximately a 5% increase, including those new positions. Now, uh, as Ms. Badera alluded to earlier, um, Last year, when our we, we view our budget as um, one, um, one item, but in fact, when it was funded last year, the Warren Committee identified certain one-time costs that they funded out of um, free cash last year and other one-time sources of funds, and they uh, funded the rest of it through the general fund. Um, so even though we consider it as one large budget, the funding mechanism is basically coming from two different pots. Um, and so uh, that is, you know, we expect will uh, will recur this year, um, which also means that it's, it, it, you have to be a little careful about making an apples to apples comparison here, because where we say our current fiscal year budget is one thing, the Warren Committee says, well, actually, you're only rolling forward $440,000 less than that because some of the money we gave you last year was one time. So it gets a little confusing as to what exactly corresponds to what. But of the um, items in our 50, fiscal 15 budget, we have identified some that uh, we uh, have identified as one-time funds. The professional development for advancement, which as was previously mentioned, is a variety of different professional development programs, some on the proficiency gap, some on early literacy, some on the new science materials, and so forth. But collectively, that set of pro uh, um, professional development funds would be a one-time fund because it's to implement the new uh, programs in the, in the advancement budget. Again, the early uh, literacy reading materials um, as an item is a, is a one-time cost because you're buying the materials. I mean, this is uh, <coughs> something you would uh, buy year after year. And again, the advancement science materials, these are the elementary science materials at $80,000, are also a one-time cost. The park technology and the professional development to implement that technology, um, again, that's an expenditure to buy some equipment to get us ready for park 
um, that is not an, uh, an ongoing, although that one may be a two-year, uh, or maybe a two-time fund, um, I mean, two-year expenditure, it is not a, a you know, <coughs> forever recurring expenditure as many of these others are. We have an, an interesting case that is similar to something that occurred last year. We have an, an extremely expensive out-of-district placement um, that is ending in fiscal 15. And while we expect it will be uh, replaced with another out-of-district placement because such things usually happen, the, the nature of this particular um, uh, placement is, is so large that the difference between it and even a regularly expensive out-of-district placement is approximately $100,000. So we expect that that portion of that particular special education um, placement would not recur after this. I mean, this is a, a very unusual event. We, um, the, um, we are also looking at, uh, in our normal professional development um, budget, not just the, um, the uh, advancement budget, um, we have a new educator evaluation tool that the state is using. Um, we are going to have to provide professional development on that tool so that our um, evaluators know how to use it um, to effectively evaluate our staff. That is going to take some professional development and a significant amount because it is, it is a, um, a complicated tool. It's not the simplest thing to use and it's going to take some, um, some training in order to do it right because as with anything, uh, the danger is not that you don't do it, the danger is you do it improperly. Um, so we have, to, <coughs> we have identified what about to a, a total of uh, $500,000 in cost in this budget which we would um, identify as one-time expenditure so for fiscal 15. Again, to take our budget request and break it down in the, the usual seven DESE categories of policy, administration, instructional leadership, instruction, <coughs> specialized technology and facilities, we have broken it out here um, in comparison with the fiscal 14 budget by each of those um, uh, columns, by each of those categories. Policy administration, as I mentioned, has gone down by 2.5% instruction leadership um, gone up by 4%, but primarily that is, a uh, large part of that is the half a position we're adding there. Um, that's the uh, technology coordinator who would be a um, instructional leader position, um, would be in that position. Instruction um, is going up uh, by, six point, by a million one or 6.5%. This um, includes two new teachers. So um, a part of that is new positions and the advancement materials as well. <coughs> so some of that uh, increase it has to do with advancement. Instructional services um, uh, at, at from 2.6 to 2.9 million dollars. That's primarily the infusion of money into athletics and the uh, allowances for in increases in the transportation budget. Special education from 9.6 to 10 million dollars again is primarily due to increasing cost of special education and special education transportation. Um, technology seems to be enormously up 14%, but it's the smallest number up here. Uh, so it goes up by $75,000, and, and 60000 of it is the park equipment. So um, it really is not as radical a, a departure as it seems there. It's just um, the issue of small numbers. And the facilities costs going up by the cost of utilities, by maintenance, custodial costs, and so forth, at around 5%. So it gives us a total request for fiscal 15 um, of $39,674,142, uh, which is a $2.1 million increase over our fiscal 14 budget, or a 5.6% increase. Mr. Pavlicek, before we leave that um, slide, if you don't mind, I just want to address that technology number. You articulated it so well that it's such a low number, but I think it's worth noting again that our budget uh, line item for technology is $585,000. And when you think about the amount of technology that we have in this, in our buildings and across the district, it really speaks to the fact that the Milton Foundation for Education, um, teachers being creative and donors choose and, and all of that have really um, played a major role because we never could have that the level of technology in our buildings that we do with that 
Um, what, yeah, so you're looking at the, the capital expenditures of last year exactly. and those proposed for this year, the $150,000 from the Milton Foundation for Education. Um, those numbers are, you know, make this seem even um, more insignificant. I mean, our, our technology staff is three people for the entire district. Um, that's not many. Um, those people are very busy. Um, and that's only the, the, the maintenance of it. That's just to keep the, the equipment running. That isn't to teach people how best to use it and what to do with all the iPads and Chromebooks and so forth that comes in this, which is, again, going back to the reason for the coordinator in the, in the advancement budget. Uh, but technology, um, like other costs, it tends to be one of those that uh, tends to be underfunded. So just to sort of recap, this is the this is the Warrant Committee version of our ask. Um, again, <coughs> the, the top line there uh, is how we view it. We're looking at a $2.1 million increase over last year. The Warrant Committee would say that last year, well, of the $37.5 million that you got, 440 was one-time funds, and 37 one you know, uh, is actually your rollover base. So they would say we're asking for more money. So to do it as an apples to apples, sort of comparison, we have identified the 500000 in this year's budget, which comes uh, as one-time funds, and roughly $2 million, um, that is our uh, request for general fund new money, two point, basically $2.05 million. So um, our request is still for $39,674,000, um, but <coughs> to the Warrant Committee, it will take the form of two requests. Uh, a, a request for $50,000 <coughs> expenditure of one-time funds and a request for $39.1 million in general fund allocation, um, assuming they choose to do it the same way they did it last year. But we, we're basically identifying sources of funds for it. Um, not to say that these are two different requests. It's just it's one request, but it has to be or it is likely to be funded from two different sources of money. So that is the, the purpose of that. Um, we were asked to uh, identify what would happen um, should we come up short. Um, and again, um, through some discussions with the Warren Committee, rather than go to a level dollar budget, which when you're asking roughly for $2 million would be um, catastrophic to try to play out what exactly uh, a $2 million, $2.1 million worth of cuts from this would look like. Through discussions with the Warren Committee, we asked for a, a figure where we could work backwards to. And so um, the, the figure we were given sort of as a starting point was, suppose you were given $1.3 million above in general fund money above um, last year, and suppose that we were to fund one-time requests out of free cash as we did last year. Um, that translates to us <coughs> into a funding level of about three quarters of a million dollars less than we've asked for in the general fund and frankly assumes that we would get the um, one-time funds of $500,000. And so the question is what would happen if you were um, funded at a level roughly $750,000 less than our request. We would l lose some money in some um, uh, non-salary items, so about $40,000 text material and supplies, a small amount of money in, in some other items, but as you see from things like our technology budget and so forth, many of those <coughs> items have been um, subject to cuts in the past and really can't support them much in, in the future. We've, uh, you know, uh, with the solar panel project and various things, we've saved money on our utilities. There's only so far you can go with that. We have no more roofs available for solar panels. They're full. Um, there's only so much we can do with some of those things. So quickly, you find yourself getting into staff. This is a, uh, a rough estimation based on one pass through by the administration. Um, it certainly is subject to some refinement, but our initial guess, our initial estimate, is that it would lose approximately 11.2 full-time equivalent uh, teachers um, at a funding level of uh, $750,000 less than our request. Um, about, uh, again, our initial estimates 
would be as something on the order of 4.5 at the elementary, 3 at the middle, and 3.7 at the high school. And there would be some um, fee increases as well, whether in rental fees or various different things. As I said before, we are not likely to be looking at athletic fees or some of those that are already there. So again, we can't really raise those much. Uh, <coughs> again, it will eliminate people's participation and really won't raise money anyway um, because of that. So uh, they'll be on, on other things. And as a result, those won't be huge. Um, and our, as in prior years, we'll look carefully at what, how to uh, play this out. We are, as in, we are starting to come up with some, some scenarios here. And our recommendations to the school committee uh, will be forthcoming once we uh, hone this in on a number. And just a, a further statement, as I said, if, if for some reason we do not get the funding in the one-time funds that would have to come from the general fund budget um, because some of them are not, they're not optional. Um, we're just putting them forward as one time. Um, so that would cause further um, degradation of the, of the general fund budget if, the, in fact, the, if the uh, one-time fund budget was not, the one-time fund request was not funded fully. So with that, we will open it up. <coughs> Any questions? I know people have asked us a little on this. Just on that last point, so the one-time funding, say we weren't able to get any, it's $500,000, and that would translate into how many FTEs? In, in a ballpark, probably around nine. Right. Probably around nine. A, an, nine. An, an additional nine. Nine. An additional nine. Because, again, some of those have been, they're not, optional expenses. I mean, when we said the $100,000 of special ed tuition was, a, you know, looking at it as a one-time fund, we still have to pay it. I mean, it's, the student is still ours and it's going out next year. That's just their last year. Uh, Ms. Baby Jones? Two, thank you. Two questions. On page 7 where you talked before, John, you talked about successes to date and you have numbers of students. Mm -hmm. um, so, and that's for 2000, I just saw the date. It's for the school year that we're in right now. Right. So I know that you wouldn't have estimates <coughs> now for that, but could you assume that they'd be somewhere around? I mean, this is a whole heck of a lot of students mm -hmm. impacted. So could we assume that next year we look at similar numbers of students? I, I think that you, just by the nature of the um, uh, requests in, in the uh, Advancement 2.0, for example, uh, science materials for the for grades three through five in the elementary. So, if you want to talk about how you could drive, that would be 300 students per for, per grade. So, that's 900 students that would be impacted directly. The reading specialist, if we bring the additional one on, there'll be students in the pre-K that would like to engage, and there'd be additional students who would be engaged. So, you could probably add another 40 or so students to that. Um, we look at the outreach worker. There'd be families and students. Uh, engaged uh, with that person so you're talking about dozens of students engaged in that process so you would definitely add to the amount of uh, students impacted on this sheet there would definitely be an add <coughs> or an upside to the amount of students impacted with this additional funding okay. and then just one more question the um, hundred thousand for athletics what is that looking at for the increase to the it, athletic it's, it's just to um, to um, completely fund the program. I mean, at the moment, in the last year, um, our, our general fund budget hasn't been sufficient to fund yes. athletics. We, I would agree. Um, we have deplete, you know, had to deplete our uh, revolving fund for the um, fees, um, been scrambling to raise money. In past years, we've had talk about having to not have spring sports and things like that. We don't want to get in that scenario again. We want to make sure that, for instance, if you are fundraising, if we are doing a walkathon. We shouldn't be doing a walkathon in March for this year's budget. That should be for next year's budget. You know, so we know going into the year how much money we have. We shouldn't be trying. Well, we're we're assuming everything's going to be fine because we think we're going to raise twenty-five thousand dollars on the you know, third weekend in March, <coughs> when it's December. So the money is to replace the fundraising, which really shouldn't be happening in a public school anyway, in my opinion. To some extent. To some extent, not uh, completely. Mm -hmm. Raised mm -hmm. some of that athletic budget. Mm -hmm. Can't depend on volunteers Correct. to do that. That's not Correct. that's not fair or or appropriate. So it would replace that fundraising uh, efforts that's been going on for the last few years. 
mm -hmm. because I also understand there's no one stepping up to do that, but even if there was, it can't replace public school funding. And then what are the other things that it would go towards? Because we're well, not going to increase user fees. They're already way too high, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I think that the, the, the best way to think about it is that the, the, the funds that go towards athletics each year come from three areas. And so nothing's going to be added and nothing's going to be changed. So we're trying to fund the same amount of services, uh, but we need an influx of funds because historically there's been a chunk of money from the regular general fund. There's been a chunk of money that we get when we charge students fees and we charge folks admission. So that's another revenue source. And then there's, there's always been this chunk that we've gotten from doing banners and doing uh, the boosters' great work that they do, the walkathon, the golf tournament, the work that the boosters do in the concession stands. That's that third bucket that has been slowly evaporating because we've needed to use more and more of it. So to Mr. Pavlicek's point, we were always able to say that we had enough money in that reserve that we didn't have to hope that they got it this year, that we knew we had it in the revolving account to be able to provide that extra bucket of funds just to com just to complete the funding cycle of what we need for a year. So this $100,000 won't get us anything more. It'll keep us from having to do something less. Last year, for instance, um, had we not diverted money, general fund money from other expenditures and put it to athletics at the end of the year, we would not have made the year on the athletic budget as it stood. Um, so we actually had to take money from other sources to, to, to make up the gap in athletics at the end of last year. We, don't want, we, we can't right. be in that position. Thank you. Mr. Walker. I have a motion. Please. Move that we submit a budget, a fiscal 15 budget of $39,674,142 to the Warrant Committee to include an advancement budget of 538000 and a request uh, for one-time expenditures of $500,000. Moved by Mr. Walker, seconded by Ms. Bagley Jones. Do we have any further discussion? I would just like to say uh, <coughs> yet again that this is an exorbitant amount of time that has gone into this work, and I'd like to thank the whole team um, <coughs> for all of your time and, and frankly, your, your talents because this doesn't happen easily and it's revision after revision, and uh, I think the fact that we have the superintendent that's so sick speaks to the time that's uh, that's gone into this and the weariness budget. that comes from it. It's all the budget, no. <laughs> but so we have a motion. It's been seconded. No further discussion. All in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you, <coughs> Mrs. Kelly. So uh, on this um, presentation, I might ask: We have in, in a previous version, we had that great chart that broke it up by staff. Uh, I'm sorry, the advancement budget sheet that broke it out by staff, technology, instructional, and yeah. materials. If we could break it out to extended time and then the professional development, if we could add yeah. that in, I think that would be a useful, rather than sending somebody to another um, presentation, I think that would be a very useful chart to have in here. I also had a couple minor edits that I would recommend to the committee, so, um, I mean, to the leadership team around it. But. Email them tomorrow. Okay. Anything else, Mrs. Kelly? Um, no, nope. we, we do have the uh, meeting with the Warren Committee on Thursday. Um, all are invited. <laughs> I'll be there. That's great. We're <laughs> really glad you're there. Be there. I'll be there. Okay. Um, anyway, that's okay. Uh -huh. That's all right. Hosted for. I might be bringing some Obon Pen goodies. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> can, can we get a guarantee on that? <laughs> I would. If we get a guarantee on that, I think. It'll, Mr. Uh, and I might. Be I don't know. We came to tonight's meeting and she didn't bring us. <laughs> 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 okay. So, um, Sorry. We would also like to make sure that the community knows and the PTOs know that we are contacting our uh, building principals and Superintendent Comey met with the PTO presidents that we will be scheduling dates to do uh, our usual uh, trip to each school so parents in each school can ask questions in a smaller setting about how these uh, budget allocations impact their child at their grade level at their school. And we were doing so in January and we'll be publishing those dates as soon as they become available to us. Uh, through the PTO presidents and the building principals. It will post this as a we, we take this uh, show on the road in, for the month of January, and what, Ms. Gormley, will post it when? As a Friday after Thursday night. Oh. 
after everybody gives their evidence. Okay. This, so this um, document will be posted online on Friday. Thank you. Yes. And I know we've done it different ways in the past, or someone said, we're meeting with the Warren Committee Thursday night, so would we have a sense of, not that there will be any, but potential cuts? Because why would we meet with the schools if we don't know what we may, what the changes that we, this is a great presentation, but if we don't know that what we can get and not get, does it make sense to meet in January with them? Mrs. Kelly? So I think this is, yeah, well, let me back up. The Warren Committee, um, some members of the Warren Committee have never been through this before. So it's an opportunity to sort of present to them, give the overview of where we're at. Um, we do have another meeting that will be scheduled with the Warrant Committee in January okay. to go over um, in more detail and to answer questions as they come up as the process, as they review each budget, but in particular the school's budget, I'm sure they have the list of questions that comes back and forth and we go through that. What we do need to coordinate, however, is before we go out to PTOs, typically we like to present <coughs> to them you know, where we're at in terms of what might the cuts actually <coughs> include in more specificity than we have thus far. And so in coordinating those dates in January, I'm not sure when our first school committee meeting is. January 8th. Okay, so after. after that, so that we could come to the 8th with a recommendation in terms of, unfortunately, where those cuts would be um, applied if needed going forward so that we can have the same message being presented to Warren Committee um, and, and all of the PTOs and anybody else who wants to listen. But Mrs. Kelly, you wouldn't necessarily know that by the January 8th date, will you? Because, I mean, your meeting with the Warren Committee this week is not a, a it's an opportunity for us to share information with them, not to get a, a number back from them, so. Well, we have a tentative number right now, and I guess it's an opportunity to benchmark and make sure okay. that, yes, that's still in place. Because what's been presented now in terms of cuts is not uh, a level dollar budget right. cut back. It's, it's more than that. And uh, Mr. Pavlicek, what is that number? 1.3. 1.3. So the Warren Committee is saying at this point, and again, this is an opportunity to check in, that they believe in um, divvying up the pie as they know it now, that the schools would get an additional 1.3 beyond what um, we have this year. And so given that, we've established sort of a rough draft as to what the cuts would entail. That needs to be fine-tuned over the next several weeks so that by the time we come to our <coughs> January meeting of the school committee, that there's a recommendation from the finance subcommittee to the full committee as to where those cuts would be um, allocated. Any further questions? Okay, so we can continue that conversation. Our, our next um, agenda item is to share any agenda items that you might have for our January 8th meeting. Does anyone have anything they would like added to that? Oh, CDM, right. Anything else? Ms. Gormley has edits to her evaluation. In the high school. High School Psych Council with the program here. of studies. Did you hear that with the program of studies? Yes, yeah. we did. Anyone else have anything to add to that agenda? Great. Um, I am going to suggest that we go into executive session for contract negotiation. So if we have nothing further here. I would entertain a motion to adjourn to executive session for contract negotiations, not to with return. With non-union personnel. Sorry, with non-union personnel. Not to return to um, open session, but to adjourn directly from executive session. And this re requires a roll call vote. Mrs. Kelly? Yes. Ms. Bagley-Jones? Yes. And myself, yes. Mr. Walker? Yes. Mrs. Badira? Yes. Mr. Zulis? Yes. And students, thank you for being here. We want to wish everyone a very happy and safe holiday and a happy new year. Thank you.